Wellington, once a factory town, grew up around the textile mills at Tonedale, owned and run for generations by the Fox family. The milling and weaving of woolen cloth required large amounts of water, and just as the town was powered by the mill, the mill was powered through waterways. Everything depended on water, clean, clear, flowing water from the River Tone. Wellington is rich with streams, gullies, weirs, leads, bridges, ponds, a network of waterways that all enjoy, but few pay much attention to. What are their origins? The answer is back in history, and who better to walk us through the years than one whose family has shaped the town and water over centuries, Richard Fox. Richard, how lovely to see you this morning. Bright November morning, well, slightly dull now. Um, and here we are at the Basins, which is one of my favourite spots in town. Um, it's just down the road from where we live. And a lot of people love to come here to walk their dogs and do some fishing and feed the ducks, which are being very vocal this morning. Um, I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about the history of the Basins and why they're actually here in the first place. What are they? Well, it's an honour to be here. They were built by Thomas Fox in the very early 1800s mm -hmm. because he wanted to maximise the amount of power available for the water wheels at his new factory at Tondale. To utilise water power, Thomas Fox moved the weaving business in 1796 from South Street to a new mill and Fox Brothers grew for the next 150 years, employing up to 5,000 people. By 1919, turnover peaked at 1.5 million, 350 million at 2022 values. So let's go back to the story about the use of the basins. So the basins were built, you were saying, when? Very early 1800s. I see. And we're going to do the history later, I believe. Yeah. But quite obviously there's more water in the winter mm. than there is in summer. Mm. At least there used to be before climate change came in. Mm. So as he wanted to maximise the amount of power available, mm. he thought up a reserve reservoir system so that water could be ponded up in the night in the summer and a greater flow go to the factory in the days in the summer to match the natural flow in the winter. Right. That meant that the machinery would have the same power available all the year round and that that was therefore maximised. Your family, the Fox family, has really um, been part of this town. It's been the reason really that Wellington became the town that it is today. Um, and water is so integral to where we are and also the factory, uh, the Fox Brothers factory down at Tonedale. So I think it would be really nice to hear a bit about your story of growing up here or your family and tell us a little bit about that. Well, I was born at Tonedale House, ah. almost on the water because there is a very large reservoir of water in an ornamental garden there which, as I said, was, could be used for fire purposes as well. It had a rather minor role in the water supply because it was not above the actual water wheel. And I was brought up on that, and I was also brought up on the railway because the railway was at the bottom of the garden, but that's another story. Um, if we want to talk about the water, then this is where the supply to the factory obviously starts because it had to flow from the basins. Perhaps we could go and have a look at the leet yep. to the mill yep. and I will explain why the leet was there and a little bit about the water wheels. Here we are at the top of the leet, um, Tonedale Mill all the way over there and the basins over here looking rather gorgeous in the sunshine. Um, so this was really the beginning of the powering of the industrial revolution in a way, down at the mill. So can you tell us a bit about how the water actually 
helped power the mill. How did it work? Um, the mill was powered by a breast shot water wheel and it's half a mile from here, as most of you probably know, down the valley. Mm. Um, and I'll give you a little bit of detail about how water wheels work in case people are interested. A breast shot water wheel is more efficient than an undershot water wheel. And what Thomas Fox did was to design, well, the basin system with a half a mile leet while the water level was dropping all the way down the valley. So you've got, so to speak, half a mile of height at the top end. Mm. He also put in half a mile of height at the bottom end right. by digging a channel from Tonedale all the way down to Tone that was so extremely that's sluggish. Side. That's on the other side of the that's mill. That's on the other side of the mill. Right. So that he was increasing the height of his wheel, both above the factory and below the factory, mm -hmm. and he was able to end up with a 30-foot water wheel to maximise the power he could get. And as I've already said, that power was maximised again by having the reserve up here. The oldest parts of the site date back to a time when machinery was powered entirely by a huge water wheel. Later, steam power was used in tandem with the water wheel, and in 1915, a large electric motor was installed. We are now at the fender, and the water flows into the basins from the westward stream, right up where you can see at the moment. And what may have happened here, in order to keep a constant flow of water to the mill, there may have been two people up here in summer altering the flow. Hello, Richard. Hello, Anita. Oh, this is a lovely spot. There's quite a drop in the level here, isn't there? Um, just from where I've come along from the basins, it's really quite high up and the water's quite still. About seven feet, I'd say. Seven feet. Um, and then down here, we've got uh, the Rockwell Green Stream, is it? That's the Rockwell Green Stream, the smaller stream, yes. Right. And then there's all this brickwork and weirs and I'm not quite sure what's going on here, actually. What's, what, what is this about? Well, what's going on here is that up top here, we've got the leet coming towards the basins, mm. originally coming from the Westwood stream, which has just gone under the sump, and it is losing height very, very slowly. So it's very, very flat. It's maintaining all its height and going into the basins. And I've often wondered why this overflow is here because I always imagined it would have been very easy to put an overflow right next to the fender down at the basins. And then I thought that this overflow here is there to protect the basins from silting up. And does any, do any of these sluices and things work still? Is no, that, because the... Um, apparatus has been removed. Earlier you had mentioned a sump, which seems to be a crucial thing in understanding how all of this flows together. So, should we go and have a look? Sump up, let's sump go and up. have a look at it. Hello Anita. We meet on the bridge. So yesterday we were down by the basins and uh, figuring out what was going on here. Here today we're quite a bit upstream and this place has always intrigued me. This is a sort of a Clapham Junction. Everything meets here. Mm -hmm. um, the most important bit used to be the Westford stream, which used to come down a gully here. It was tapped further up right. and come under the bridge we're standing on in a straight line. And three yards the other side of the bridge, it goes under the sump, where it goes underneath the Rockwell Green stream. 
and then comes up again on the other side. So Rockwell Green Stream is the one coming along here? The Rockwell Green Stream and is... And this literally goes underneath? ...is behind us and this literally goes under oh. the Rockwell Green Stream and then comes up again. Right. Um, because, as we've already said, the Westwood Stream is three feet higher in height than the Rockwell Green Stream and has more water in it anyway. Right. That is what used to happen. Um, it doesn't happen anymore mm. because that supply was cut off. It comes now from further up in the Rockwell Green Stream mm. and it appears at this point from under the magic tree. The magic which tree? Which is down there. Okay. Yes. And what um, on earth is a magic tree and what's magic about it? Well, the magic is that it shouldn't be there because right. the water goes literally right straight under it. Wow. And it is in a bricked up channel yes. crossing the open ground field, which is just across there. But there is a bricked up stream, which is about 300 yards long, which leads from the Rockwell Green stream at open ground, comes out under the magic tree here, and these days it feeds the basins because it goes straight through the sump as the Westwood stream used to do. As we're looking at the water now coming out under the magic tree, mm. why don't we go and see where it comes from? I think that's a really good All idea. All right, let's right. go. Off we go. So here we are at Rockwell Green Stream. Uh, the kids are about to come out of the primary school and you're going to tell us, I think, something about this contraption here. Indeed. Yes, we've come 300 yards up the Rockwell Green Stream mm -hmm. um, from the Magic Tree and we're on the edge of the Oaken Ground Estate and there's a very modern and very smart fender, small fender here, um, and when that is raised a bit, it lets the water go into the brick channel that goes under the field, parallel to the Rockwell Green Stream, down to the Magic Tree. The basins group regulate the flow of water into the basins by raising and lowering right. that Back fender end. a little bit. Right then, uh, let's head off, shall we? And see if we can find some folks from the basins volunteer group who might be doing some work. Excellent idea. back to the 1980s because then the group applied for grants so they were able to buy better equipment yeah. um, mm -hmm. and they did a lot of work. Leslie will tell you about how they cleared the triangle but um, the council allowed the group to use the ski hut because the ski slope was no longer used um, and unfortunately the ski hut bent down and they lost all their equipment so it really was all start again. And the council actually provided the group with the first container. When I first came down here walking the dog along here, I never realised it was a pond. There was just overgrown area. Earlier this year, when the duckweed started coming, um, I put a net in to fish it out and had two nukes in the net. So there is signs of wildlife coming back to it. My dream would be for loads of dragonflies here. I love dragonflies. Tell us a bit about who you are and your family, because you're a fox, mm -hmm. um, which is very much part of our story, part of the place. Without your family, I don't think there would be a Wellington, and certainly not the Wellington that we know today. I don't like to think that there wouldn't be a Wellington, but um, yeah. It, it would be very it, different. The, the family definitely had an impact on Wellington. And um, yeah, where do I fit in? I'm the seventh generation to Thomas, who built this house for his family and who built the mill here at Wellington and the mill at 
called uh, Cold Harbour Mill at Afcom, mm-hmm. um, and they were woolen and worsted uh, um, cloth manufacturers basically. Um, but the one, one of the things about Fox Brothers was it was a fully vertical mill, so from raw material to finished goods, and because um, they built the factories near waterways where there was a good sort of um, constant flow of water. Mm-hmm. That was one of the critical things for um, sort of cloth making and for the dyeing and for the finishing, etc. The water is used in every part of the mill process, is it? Yeah, well, not every part, but certain sections. So you've got you've got to wash the wool, the raw wool. For the, so that's one one part, and then um, you might use um, you might dye you might pre dye the wool as well. So. And you need water for that. Mm. But the most important was the scouring and the finishing, the milling of the cloth. So down at Tone Works, for instance, here in Wellington, uh, Tone Works, which is further downstream than the main mill at Tone Dale, um, it was critically important and um, very much part of the process in terms of the cloth. And what about this? This looks like a very old. Um, this is the, old, the oldest pattern book. And this is from 1787, and this is, in fact, is this is the Ware family who um, were who originally had had the mill before Fox Brothers got um, before Thomas got involved um, in the in the in the firm. And this, yeah, this is exceedingly old. This book, but even then, t- and most beautiful of, handwriting. Yeah. And most of the production then was down at Tone Works. Um, there was a little up here, yeah. but um, so Tone Works, the the whole story sort of starts at Tone Works, really. Doesn't yeah, it? it does. It does. It does really. And then Thomas built a much bigger factory for the spinning and the weaving up, up sort of up here, sort of half a mile away, basically. But also this, at the Miller Cold Harbour at the same time. So the Miller Cold Harbour is more about the worsted cloths, and here it was more about the woolen woolen cloths. By the late 20th century, Britain's wool industry was declining, so in 1992, Fox Brothers ceased production at Tonedale and the site became home to a wide variety of small businesses, including stained glass crafting, bookbinding, microbrewing and even violin making. Sadly, all now gone. Morning, Anita. Good to see you both. Um, I've just been talking to Ben about some of the history of recent history really of the factory and the foxes and here's another couple of foxes. What are you doing? Well we've come down here um, because we've just been filming up at the basins oh, yeah. and we're now in the house that yeah. Thomas Fox was building at the same time as the basins were being constructed right. and we're going to have a look at the history as to why the basins was built in the first place. Excellent. Well um I think I'll leave you to it if that's all right. Cloth has been made in the west of England, notably in Devon, for thousands of years. We picked the story up soon after William the Conqueror, um, when the main production was in the towns through the guilds, which had very strict discipline and very high standards. But they all were very small enterprises because no master would have more than six apprentices, um, which limited the size and the scope. So our, our great, great, great grandfather got involved with the manufactory um, through the weirs, his relatives. Yes, indeed. He was. Um, he came up from Cornwall. He was apprenticed into the weir firm, but was working at that point in a warehouse in South Street, he took over the business from the Weirs, who were quite happy to take the back seat, and almost immediately he was taking it over. He was confronted with the huge problems of adjusting to the Industrial Revolution, which he solved temporarily by introducing horses, and he had very difficult trading conditions and was rescued by being very quick to seize an opportunity of joining in the market of selling a type of cloth called long elves to the Chinese. He was able to outstrip the competition, needed to expand, 
And so he bought Cold Harbor Mill, um, which had a leet. He learned a lot from that. And very soon afterwards, he started to build a new factory at Tondale. Tonedale Mill was undeniably an iconic textile mill, and the adjacent tone works is a site of international historical importance. Yet only empty buildings now remain, slowly but steadily becoming more and more derelict and tumble down, even irredeemable. I just really love this little part of the Wellington waterways because um, the Westwood stream comes underneath the railway bridge here. And it's really, it's just really quiet in this little patch. And when the beech trees are just turning golden and orange, I really love to come down here and just, um, just listen to the water really. The little fairy bridge, I think it's called. Well, and it's just a little bit of brickwork that goes underneath this massive beech tree, which must be a hundred years old. Um, and it's just that blend of the natural world and human history and maybe a little bit of fairy magic as well. Well, we're now walking down from near where the railway crossing is right. back towards the basins mm -hmm. and towards the spot where the original fender used to be right. in Fox Brothers days. I gather this was a bit of a hotspot um, 30 or 35 years ago, uh, back in the 1980s, around about this time actually, near Christmas. We had a tremendous flood on Christmas Day, um, about two and a half inches of rain, and I can remember very well going round to the lodge at the entrance to Fox Brothers about seven o'clock in the evening. Mm. Michael Fox, George Bowen, um, Robert Spurway, and all sorts of other people were trying to get in touch with tenants who'd been flooded out. And I can remember a question being asked, has the fender up at the basins been lifted? Now that fender used to be in a little hole just okay. down there. And the main stream used to go through there. And if the fender there was lifted, then the water would not pond back to the cottages at Westford. And if the fender was down, then the water was sent straight on into the Leet, going round that corner, right. going down to the basins to fill the basins. The cottagers, quite rightly, um, weren't totally happy about the whole situation. And the net result of that was that some years later, Somerset County Council voted £500,000 to put in a flood prevention scheme right. from much further up in Westford mm. all the way down. Mm. And they did a huge amount of work up there, which has been very effective. Mm. But when they got to this point, which is just down here, mm. they ran out of money. Uh -huh. They had blocked up the original fender, which was what down was there, right. and put in this beautiful concrete structure here, right, so this... which was going to be a new repeat fender, which would again control the flow of water to the basins. Okay. But at that point, they ran out of money. Hello. <laughs> Hello. I'm down in the stream, only it's a dry stream. Um, sort of stream of leaves at the moment. Uh, this little dry channel, what's now a dry channel, and down here, has always intrigued me whenever I walk down this way. What was all this about then? And why is there no water here anymore? Well, we're a little bit nearer the basins um, than we were before. There's no water here um, because the new fender which is just a few yards up there, has not got a fender in it, so the water can't travel down these channels anymore. 
This channel that you're standing in here used to be the feed leet to the basins and this was the bypass so that if the fender at this point was raised then the water would not go into the basins and any maintenance work needed could be done there and the stream this way would flow straight in and join the Rockwell Green stream and so on down to the wheel at the factory. One of the things that I love about Wellington's waterways is actually not just the water, it's things like this, the bridges and the old kind of industrial architecture that has landscaped this area so much. Um, the bridge that we're standing on now, of course, there's no water running through here, but I guess it must be one of the original bridges from, the, uh, from when the factory was really getting going. Maybe early 19th century, do you think, or mid 19th century? Any ideas? Well, I believe that these, there are four of these bridges in the basins area, mm. and I believe they must have been pretty well original. In other words, sometime between 1800 and 1830. But these four bridges are one of the great features of the Basins area. You're absolutely right to draw our attention to them. Yeah, they're lovely. They're really lovely. As for the present, from an environmental standpoint, the unfortunate legacy of the industrious Victorians was the unrelenting and largely unrestricted pollution of our environment. We are still paying the 200-year-old price, but redevelopment is underway. Sustainability lies at the heart of our aspirations for Tonedale Mill, Tone Works and Forces Field, which itself has become a valued community asset, yet again close to Wellington's waterways. The health of the natural world with that of the human community will be married together and plans for the surroundings will increase biodiversity, help carbon capture and flood mitigation, boosting nature's resilience. The same values will be lovingly and carefully adopted for the ensuing next great step, the Wellington Community Farm, which will facilitate community-supported agriculture, also interwoven by our small watery arteries. The coming of the Community Farm Project truly facilitates the establishment of an extensive green corridor, including Fox's Field, which is at the beginning of its life, yet the waterways around Wellington are aged and in some ways at least unloved. But this blue network, Wellington's lifeblood, is every bit as important as our cherished green spaces. One of the greatest drivers of the burgeoning community spirit, shared vision and purpose hereabouts, is the fantastic group of people that equals Transition Town Wellington, who have brought about a sea change in Wellington's environmental attitudes, so that there's a shared environmental consciousness. The community now has a vision for the living ecosystem that is decorated with the waterways, where adults, children, and their four-legged friends walk along the streams and leads, enjoying the open spaces too, whilst the anglers sit patiently at the basins, contemplating what lies below the surface, and from time to time helping an injured swan, duck or moorhen. Nigel, lovely day today, isn't it? Yeah, it's lovely, isn't it? Absolutely beautiful weather. Mill looking rather gorgeous, yes, although indeed. very dilapidated. Lovely, yes. Um, and I gather that you are Wellington's one and only, so far, Water Guardian. Yes, indeed. Yes, apparently that's that right. I am the, the one and only Water Guardian and I've been sort of looking after the, the Westwood Stream and the River Tone now for about a year. The community are now directly involved, keeping a watchful eye on our waterways by becoming Water Guardians. Nigel Lilly, Wellington's first Water Guardian, has inspired many others to follow him, each monitoring and recording the pollution levels and wildlife. The scheme, run by Somerset Wildlife Trust and funded by Wessex Water, is another way for citizens to help care for our precious water, ensuring that it's there running clean and clear for future generations.
we do live in hope that the waterways will have their day again, alongside the mills they once served so faithfully, perhaps at the beginning of a metamorphosis. Once again, the waterways and mills might flourish in a new way.